Hey, welcome to Arcade Church. Uh, my name's Cole Harper, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so glad you're joining us online this morning. There may be a host of reasons why you're joining us online. It could be you got a bug or a virus moving through your house and it didn't make sense to mobilize the entire troop and get them here. Um, or maybe you are in one of those positions where you're just kicking the tires of Arcade Church, uh, trying to see and get an idea of what we're about, all that jazz. Um, if that's you, would love you to do me a favor. If you were to go to arcadechurch.com uh, and then click on the visit button, that will take you to a landing screen that it'll prompt you to share just a few pieces of information, your name, uh, anything you'd like to know about us as a church, uh, how to get in contact and hit submit. And that will help us follow up with you and get a dialogue or a conversation going, right? It can be hard to find your place at a new church and we would love nothing more than to make that as common sense and as intuitive as possible. So uh, Craig is going to be taking us, I think it's I think it's the third installment of the Cultivate series. Uh, subtitle there is Marriage in the Small Things. And it's been very helpful, I think, for us as a body because it's helping us to realize that most of the battles or most of the uh, obstacles to Christ's likeness, they're not occurring in the major life-changing events. If anything, they're happening in the meat and potatoes ordinary events, right? Uh, the things that make your life tick on a day-to-day -day basis. That's the kind of arena for where Christ's likeness uh, emerges and the covenant faithfulness of God towards us um, can be imaged in our married relationships. And even if you know some of you watching are single, it's important to, I think, remember that all of us are shaped or in the blast radius of uh, Christ honoring marriages, uh, real marriages, and hard marriages, right? Every one of us who's participating in this service has been on the receiving end of the implications of someone else's marriage too. And so we're called as a body to image Christ in every domain of the human experience we find ourselves in. And uh, I hope you'll take the time to posture yourself and like I'm going to be trying to do and prepare your hearts to hear the word preached as it pertains to this part of the human experience this morning. Uh, so now would be a great time to let the dog out, uh, top off your coffee, that kind of thing. And um, we'll get started here in a few minutes. And then I will see you back here once service concludes for a few thoughts to wrap up. Thanks so much.
Good morning, church. Let's stand together as we sing to our great God, joining him with all heaven and all earth. And all creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. No praise Him, oh praise Him. Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer gleam, No praise Him, oh praise Him. Church, as we gather together to give praise to God, I want us to remember the words of Jesus whenever he says, he who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And in that, I think it's helpful for us to remember what Jesus told us to focus on whenever he said that. He tells us in our Christian life, we can get discouraged sometimes at our lack of growth, at our lack of looking more and more like Jesus. But I wanna remind us this morning, Jesus did not tell you to look at your fruitfulness and abide there. He told us, abide in me, not our fruitfulness. He is the focus of our worship. He is the object of our salvation. And so let him gently lift your head this morning to remind you of his love for you and of his kindness to you. It is not because of anything righteous in us it is because of his mercy that he's made us alive together with Christ. So let's continue to sing together of that goodness and abide in him this morning.
this morning that it is Jesus and Jesus alone it is not Jesus plus my own ability our own ability to measure up Father that every work that was needed to be done to bring us into your kingdom has been accomplished fully finished nothing to add to it and certainly nothing to take away from it God, we bless you for your grace this morning that is greater than we could possibly fathom. That you have seen us to our core, God, and you have made provision for us. So we love you, God. Would you continue to reveal Jesus to us more and more and more that we might treasure him as the mighty friend of sinners. We pray this in Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen. We love you, church. Well, good morning, Arcade. Good morning. It's great to see everyone today. You probably noticed there's a few people missing. We have more than 150 of our women up at a retreat up at uh, Zephyr, so we're praying for them this morning. Well, welcome. My name is Tom, and I'm on staff here at Arcade Church, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome you this morning. Um, if you are online, we want to say welcome to you as well. There should be a link for you to click on if you're online, um, for you to click on and find out ways you can connect here at Arcade Church. We would love to see you connected in whatever way you're able to. And then for those of you here in person, if you're new, I want to encourage you to check out the Welcome Hub. Sonia and Krista are there. They'll greet you and give you a gift after the service and even just encourage you with ways you can get connected here at Arcade Church where it is our mission that we want to see as many people as possible get the chance to hear, see, and follow Jesus. And we do that through learning Jesus, building genuine community, and hopefully being becoming, as he changes us, joyfully generous people. Um, so let me share a few. I would hope, I, my thought was, is there that I, you hope, I hope that you see those three elements in everything we do throughout the week, through our Sunday mornings, even through the announcements. So I do have a few announcements this morning. Um, this week, so we've been doing men's breakfast every month. It's the third Thursday of the month. Um, we'll, we'll take a break for summer, so we won't meet June, July, or August. So we only have two left. We've had some amazing men come and share with us. We had Michael Lynn, Ben Fox. Last month, Pastor Nick shared. And they've been sharing stories of life 
transformation that Jesus has done, really stories of victory where they've shared some of their struggles, but how Jesus has brought them through those. And uh, next month in May, we will have my good friend and Arcadian Aaron Wainscott sharing. But this week, um, on Thursday morning at 6, I want to encourage you to come to the Fellowship Hall, men. Um, we'll have amazing burritos, and Pastor Cole is going to be sharing. And I wrote this down because I want to get this right. Um, Cole's going to be sharing. He's going to break down how he had to rely on the Spirit's power for years to overcome deep, ingrained anger in his life. And how he still has to rely on Christ's Spirit to maintain a posture of dependence and repentance on Jesus. And I think anger is something in the church we need to talk about more. Um, We talked about it last September, so we're revisiting it. So I want to encourage you men to come out. Share, Cole's going to share openly and vulnerably his story, and I think you're going to be encouraged by it. So I encourage you to check that out. And we're going to have amazing food. That's from 6 to 7.15 in the morning, Thursday morning. Come check it out. Young married dinner date night this Friday, 6 o'clock at the Fellowship Hall. You're young, you're married. Come check it out. Make connections with other folk your age, and uh, there's dinner served there as well. All right, last year, one of our fun events we did was the barbecue challenge. We're doing it again this year. It's on Saturday, May 19th. For that to happen, we need you all to sign up. We need some people to sign up to serve, to barbecue, to smoke, to cook some meat for that event. Um, We will have a blind taste testing panel this year. We improved it from last year. That's not going to be voting by everybody. You can come and just sample. Um, We'll have a blind taste testing panel, and they'll be awarding prizes to the different contestants. And so I encourage you to come out. I know Texas is supposed to have the best barbecue, but we have a couple of staff members from Texas, and they don't enter. It tells me California has the best barbecue, so we need to show it. Yeah, I got Brian there. Well, maybe we'll have some Texas people say you're wrong, and they'll, they'll sign up too. So please sign up for that. It's going to be an awesome time, a genuine community and fellowship, and enjoying some great food. Um, do that on the app today. If people don't sign up, we need at least 10 to 15. Um, if people don't sign up, we won't have it. But I, I'm confident we will, because we've got a whole bunch of people that can cook. All right, next Sunday night, last announcement, the night of worship is next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. That's a time where we just come together, and it's kind of in the description of the name. We worship the Lord together. We spend time in fellowship together with him, and it's a chance also where we get a chance to pray for one another. It's a really special time. I always leave feeling those times feel so energized and encouraged in my walk with the Lord, so I want to encourage you guys next Sunday night, 5 o'clock, to check that out. All right, we mentioned joyful generosity in worship. One of the ways we worship the Lord is through giving. We follow in Jesus' footsteps. He actually gave his life for us. We give of our time. We give of our talents. We give of our resources. And so if you would like to give some of your treasures, some of your resources, there's a few ways you can do that. You can give online through the app. Um, You can give. There's boxes out front in the lobby out here. You could even drop by the church office this week if you want to give. So that's the how. But I want to take a moment to cast a little vision of the why. We were recipients of Arcade's joyful generosity, my wife and I, for more than 23 years. We served as missionaries in inner city LA. During our time there, we saw God transform a lot of lives. And one is, um, I'm going to call him Manuel, since we're online, I changed his name. There's a young man named Manuel we met in 2002. He used to stand in front of our house with a group of guys about three nights a week drinking. And drinking and kind of raising a ruckus. And they were nice guys. It didn't bother me. Um, But usually in the mornings, I'd go out the next morning, a bunch of empty beer bottles in front of our house. I'd clean them up, put them in our recycled trash can. And over time, though, Manuel began to get curious. He got to know some of us in the church, began going to church. And um, his life was slowly transformed by Jesus. Um, He secretly struggled with meth addiction which we didn't know, and it finally came out one day. And so we're in the process of getting him to a drug treatment home. And in that process, though, he had gotten in some trouble. And there was a, a day where we were in our front room of our house, and for those of been there, we had these large windows, and I hear this ruckus outside, ruckus outside, and it's loud. And there's weapons drawn, and I see Manuel in the middle of it. So we call 911. And it's not long before, I've never seen that many guns in person, that the LAPD and their SWAT team is there with so many guns pointing them all at my friend Manuel, who I had grown to love at this point. Thankfully, he was peacefully and safely arrested, spent the next five years in prison where Jesus really got a hold of him. He came out, got drug treatment, and then came back to be a servant leader in our church. And he went through our discipleship training. And I remember one day he was walking around our neighborhood 
And one of the guys he used to do drugs with walked up to him, said, man, well, you look different. And he goes, well, thank you. And he goes, I got I to gotta ask you, how are you so different? I can tell you're different. What is it? And he goes, well, do you have time? Do you really want to hear? And Pablo said, yeah, I'd like to hear. And Manuel began to share his testimony with Jesus and began to disciple him and led other guys to the Lord. I share that story with you, not to say how great our ministry was, but to say stories like Manuel's of changed lives are happening all over the world as a result of your joyful generosity through our missionaries. We have people like the Culps in Mexico. Their ministry is thriving and flourishing, and now they're in Cuba, and they're expanding to other countries around the world. We have the Modas in Brazil doing amazing work. The Guptas in India seeing hundreds of churches planted and growing as a result of your joyful generosity. The Kachuks in the Ukraine, in a war-ravaged country, they're ministering to widows and so many people um, coming home from the war. In the midst of that destruction, God's doing a beautiful thing. We have the Dionyches right here in Sacramento ministering to international students. And one of their students named Vivi came to Christ, got, a, got involved in Arcade Church, and now she's a missionary that we support back home in our home country of Vietnam. And then you also have the Cassidy sent out a staff here to plant a church right here in our backyard at Antelope, and we're seeing people come to Christ there. I share that with you to cast vision for joyful generosity to say you're giving is not a, only an act of worship, but it's having a real impact around the world. So I want to say thank you on behalf of our missionaries and encourage you to keep it up. Because those life stories like Manuel take years and time to develop. So we support our, pray, our missionaries and we pray for them. All right, let me pray for us this morning. Father, thank you. Jesus, thank you. You gave your life for us. Um, as we sang, we now have merit because of you. We can stand before the Father because of you. So we praise you for that this morning. Lord, thank you for um, the women who have been up in Tahoe, um, learning from your word and enjoying genuine community together. I've been hearing great reports of God, you teaching them and growing them. So Lord, may they come back transformed, encouraged, refreshed, blessed, Lord. And um, we just thank you for these amazing women that are a part of our community here. God, would you... Um, would you bless them as they come home today? We look forward to that. Um, and God, thank you for the missionaries we support around the world. Would you bless all of them? Not just financially, but spiritually, Lord. Would they be walking with you, knowing you deeply in a love relationship, and that their ministry would be an overflow of that? Finally, Lord, we thank you for the chance for us to worship and pray here together this morning. Lord, would you be honored and glorified by it all? Would you speak through our brother Craig? Would your spirit make the word come alive? Would you convict us? Would you teach us? Would you grow us? Would you have your way with us in this next time as we study your word together? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In becoming your wife, I promise before God and these friends to love you and cherish you, to have you and to hold you from this day forward in good times and in bad, in joy and in grief, till death separates us, that we may become one in spirit, one in mind, one in affection, and above all things, one in Christ. In becoming your husband, I promise before God and these friends to love you and cherish you, to have you and to hold you from this day forward, in good times and in bad, in joy and in grief, till death separates us, that we may become one in the spirit, one in mind, one in affection, and above all things, one in Christ. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Craig, and I'm on staff here at Arcade Church. It's my privilege to uh, open the Word of God with you and, uh, and see what God has for us today. Before we get to that, though, I just want to repeat something that Tom announced, and that's next Sunday night's night of worship. I, you need to be here. All of us need to be here. Uh, it's a chance for us to be able to honor the Lord 
but then also it's a chance for us to understand that we are not alone, that we are together, that we are one body. And so it's five o'clock, it's very interactive, it's a very powerful moment, a very powerful time for our church family of prayer and worship, and we'd love to have you here. I know that there are things to do on Sunday nights, um, but I, I, would, I would say put those aside for this. I think it's that important for you to be here. Also, this is the first worship gathering without two incredibly beautiful and wonderful Arcadians. Um, this past week, our brother Frank Privat, uh, through a long battle with cancer, that battle is now over. The victory is won because of Christ, and he passed away this past week. And so we need to pray for Jerry and the boys, the, 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 the grandchildren uh, during this time. Uh, their loss is our loss because Frank was such a great man and we, we are a better church because of his presence and we will continue to enjoy his memory as we grow. And then also our, our beloved Irene Middleton went home yesterday and, uh, and she will be missed as well. What a joy she was, you know, uh, Tom was talking about transformation, and uh, she's almost at the top of the list of people that were completely and absolutely transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I will miss, I will miss her purple hair. And so someone's got to take that up, all right, all right, to wear purple hair. Yeah. <laughs> ushers, ushers. Right. Yeah. Oh, dear. I would if I could. I would if you'd even notice, but you probably wouldn't even notice, and so that's, that's all right. Well, hey, let's have, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we come to you because you, are, you, you have secured for us victory. This past week, death came for Frank, and yesterday, death came for Irene, and Jesus turned death away in both counts with the promise of our Lord and Savior in John chapter 8, that those who believe in Him will not see death. Death no longer has a sting. Death no longer has finality. Death no longer has uh, teeth to bear down on us. We need not fear, and so we have great joy in knowing where our beloved Frank and Irene are. We thank you for that security. We thank you for the many promises that you give us for that. And Father, right now we do pray for the women up at the retreat that you will give them safe travel home, bring them back to our homes that we can be able to enjoy hearing wonderful stories of you moving up at Tahoe. We love you, Lord God, and we thank you for all your good gifts in your son's precious and holy name, Jesus, amen. Well, we are, this is a second in a series called Cultivate Marriage in the, in the Little Things, um, and uh, the fact that I'm doing a marriage sermon on a day when 150 women are up at Tahoe was strategic. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I, I mean, I, I just, that was bad, bad planning on my part, and what makes it worse is that my wife is the one planning the retreat. So, yes, Debbie and I talk from time to time, but somehow I missed the memo of that uh, thing, and so that's just the way it goes. But, but it, it really is marriage. We tend to think that marriage is an explosion, that it's volcanic, but the reality is it's an erosion. An erosion is gradual. Certain things happen, little things happen that they just pile up and up and up and up. Before we know it, something catastrophic does happen but we just didn't see it coming. And so what we're doing in these four Sundays uh, is just dealing with some little things, little things that matter for big things in the context of our marriage. Many of you know uh, John Piper. He, he was a pastor in, in uh, Minneapolis for many, many years. He's retired since, but he still has a very strong, very present ministry uh, to many, many people. Early on in my ministry, I was very grounded in his teaching in many different areas. And you'd think that when you, when you hear him preach, that you, you think, this is a guy that's up here and everybody else is down here. 
You, you, know, you know you shouldn't make those judgments, but, but you think, man, I, I bet this guy is clicking on all cylinders. This guy is so much closer to Jesus than I am. I bet his life is wonderful. I bet his marriage is wonderful. I bet everything about him is marriage. Years ago, he wrote a book called Momentary Marriage. Yeah, Momentary uh, Marriage. And uh, his wife, Noel, wrote the foreword. And so this is what she wrote. I know some couples who think and feel so much alike that they can work together, minister together, live together, and raise children together with hardly any conflict. Well, there might be a couple like that, but it's not us. In our real life, I swing somewhere between two extremes. At one end of the pendulum arc, uh, I'm in wonder, how in the world did I get such an amazing husband? By contrast, when inertia and resistance are dragging us downward, I'm asking myself, how in the world did we get into such a mess? What happened to make us feel this kind of disagreement and unhappiness? We know it is the weight of our sin that accelerates us into the seasons at the bottom. Maybe this is, this is where you are in your marriage right now. You are in a season At the bottom, right out of the gate, I just want to tell you, seasons come and go. It's a season. It's a season that does that. And what happens so often is that there's this wedding ceremony, the adrenaline of the wedding ceremony, the the enthusiasm, the joy of fine food and exotic travel on the honeymoon, and then when you get home, all of a sudden, the curtain is pulled back and you really see who you just made promises to. You see, maybe for the first time, your spouse in front of you, naked physically, but also naked socially, naked emotionally, you see them for who they are, and at best, you're surprised and you go on. At worst, you're devastated because you can't believe you're so blind. That happens in most marriages. Is that the one person on the planet who sees us the way that we really are, is the one that made a promise that they would never leave us nor forsake us. In every human relationship, there is this this principle of consequence. We talked briefly about it last Sunday. And it's basically, the, the principle of consequence is there's a direct correlation between the seeds you plant and the fruit you harvest. In fact, God's word says it as much in Galatians chapter six, when it says, uh, oh, here's the daily goal of this series. I'm sorry, I, I, should, I skipped over this. To glorify God by possessing and practicing a daily harvest mentality within all relationships, especially within marriage. To glorify God by possessing and practicing a daily harvest mentality within all relationships, especially within marriage. And I wrote in all relationships because I'm I'm making it a point in this sermon series to not read any of the passages that talk specifically about marriage. Because I recognize that there are many, many people in this room who have gone through a marriage and you've divorced, you've lost your loved one, uh, you've never married, you have no plans to marry or you want to be married, young people, you're single, likely that in five or ten years you too will be married. But these things that we're talking about, they play in all relationships, but specifically in marriage relationships. And it's important that we go in with a harvest mentality that whatever we plant, it's going to grow. If you plant a weed seed, which who would want to do that? But if you plant a weed seed, that guess what's going to grow? Weeds. If you plant a, a peach pit, then what do you expect to grow? What well, you expect to have peaches. If you plant a peach trip, a peach, peach pit, I'm still shook up by the purple hair comment. But if you plant a peach pit and you get an apple tree, you, you better run because there's something wrong with the universe. Something's not right. So whatever you plant in your marriage and your relationships, that is exactly what you're going to harvest. It is going to be that. And God's word says that, Galatians chapter 6, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Whatever you're planting in your relationship, whatever you're planting in your marriage, 
That is what you're going to reap. That is the harvest that you're going to have. So we are struck by the smallness of that seed, but yet the smallness of that seed, it grows to something very, very large that looms over us. So what do we do? Well, to keep with the garden motif a little bit, to keep it going with that, I thought this, and we talked about this last week, I'm going to briefly talk about it today. Prepare the soil with worship in your marriage. Prepare the soil of worship within your relationships. Flinch vertical. When there's something going on in your life, at the core of that problem, whatever it is, is a worship problem. And so as husband and wife, you get together and you secure who is the master of this house, who is the one who rules over us. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is the God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He is the one that we follow. He is the one that we take cues from. He is the one that we worship. And when a husband and wife get that ironed out, then things can begin to fall into place. And that's why young people, that's why the Word of God says never, 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 never marry someone who does not believe in Christ if you are professing to believe in Christ. Don't do it. Because right out of the gate, right at the moment you say I do, there is a worship problem in your home. And if that worship problem is there, there is a vertical problem that pans out horizontally. So the Word of God warns us about that. It it tells us, be very, very careful about who you marry. Make sure that that worship issue is there. I I didn't read this last Sunday because I knew I was going to read it today. Matthew 22, passage you all know very, very well, verse 37. And Jesus said to this lawyer, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Here is a vertical aspect. You want to obey the law? then you begin with worshiping, loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you see the horizontal aspect? As I love God with every fiber of my being, what bleeds out is this horizontal manifestation of loving others in that same way that God loves me. In fact, Jesus goes so far to say in the very next verse, On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You go to the Ten Commandments. You go to all of the commands in the Old Testament. And every one of them find at their root loving God, loving neighbor. Loving God, loving the spouse. So it all begins with worship. And the purpose of marriage is to glorify God in worship. Not your happiness. Not your self-fulfillment. When you seek those things, you find nothing but struggle and resentment and bitterness. But there's something that happens when a husband and wife are bent on worshiping their creator and drawing near to Christ in worship and understanding that he is their master. There's something that happens. We begin to find that amidst our circumstances that we are receiving the very thing that we've always wanted, contentment, peace, fulfillment, But it wasn't acquired by us trying really, really hard and putting sweat in the bucket. It was acquired simply by knowing who we're worshiping and loving God. He does things to us. He changes things. And he changes circumstances. Just like he changed Tom's friend. Just like he changed you and me by the power of his word. You may be thinking, that sounds great, Craig, but we've got real problems. We've got real issues. We've, we've got issues. We both love Jesus. We both love the gospel. We love everything about it. But right now, we are going through that season at the bottom, and we have been there for a long, long time. Well, it could be that one of the problems is this two prong, this two prong problem in your marriage and in mine. I have the same two prong problem in my marriage that you do in yours, and here it is. There is the presence of sin and the absence of mercy. Whatever, whatever is the problem in your marriage, you probably have a label. It is the presence of sin at the core of that, at the root of that is sin. Rebellion against God, 
So there is this presence of sin, but in the presence of sin, there is very little presence of mercy. There is the absence of mercy. And so number one is we, we cultivate the soil of our garden with worship, but then number two, pull the weeds of sin. We pull the weeds of sin. And here, this, uh, uh, permit me to go on a little rant. It's a little one. But in our culture today, everybody has a take on diagnosing the human problem. With words like disorder, manic, low self-esteem, lack of self-actualization, wrong identity, anxiety, depression, all of these words that describe the human condition in our cultures, yeah, those are good words to have, good words, good words. But the moment we as Christians, we, we speak into this as a, the real diagnosis of the human condition is sin. All of a sudden, oh, you guys are just about, you're just, you're just all about guilt and shame and talking about sin. You know, because the reason why this is a rant is because do you recognize that the diagnosis of sin is the first part of the good news of the gospel? Do you want to know why the psychological world calls something a disorder? Do you want to know why? Because they don't know where it came from. They don't know how to treat it. And so all they can do is diagnose it. That's it. They don't know. They don't know. But when we say that we are sinners, we, we are trusting in the God of creation saying the number one problem, the core problem of the human condition is that every single human being is in sin is in rebellion against God. And the beautiful thing about that is there's a cure for that. That's why we talk about sin. We don't want to load people down with guilt and shame. We want to talk about the cure. But to talk about the cure, we got to talk about the original diagnosis, sin. And so here's the truth that we can be able to embrace. In your marriage, you struggle with sin. And in your marriage, you also struggle with a sinner. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a sinner. And if you don't know them, get their name first so you can be friendly about it. <laughs> and husbands, for those of you who are here and your wife is not because she's at the retreat, yes, you do get points. But just wait till she gets home. And right as she gets out of the car, just say, hey, babe, welcome home. You're a sinner. <laughs> and I've got to live with you. But that's what it comes down to in our marriage. That's why this is marriage in the little things, is that I realize that I, as a husband, as a man, as a brother, as a friend, I struggle with sin. But then I also realize I struggle with someone who is a sinner. And there is this perpetual struggle. So here are a couple of questions for us. Which do you think about most? Do I think about my sin or do I think about Debbie's? Hers is bigger, so I talk about more of hers. <laughs> so do I talk about my sin or do I talk about her sin? I'll tell you this right now. I, and I, this is full disclosure. Debbie's not here, but she'll probably watch this later this week. So I have a couple of days of grace. But I've got to confess to you, I would, I would much rather, I would much rather maximize Debbie's sin and minimize my own. I would much rather build a case, a, a Perry Mason-like case on why she's more guilty than I am. Why, she's a bigger sinner. I would love to take all of her words and actions. I have no problem putting them under the microscope just so that she can see everything of what she says and what she does or what she doesn't say or what she doesn't do. And then all of a sudden, I read Jesus' words in Matthew 7. It's following after, uh, it's preceded by probably the most quoted verse in the Bible. Even non-Christians know it. They probably don't know it's in the Bible, but they quote it. Judge not, lest ye be judged. For the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured against you. Then Jesus says this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? 
As Jesus is preaching this, I have to believe that there were some people that got a laugh out of that. Just think about the mental picture. Your vision is impaired by a humongous beam sticking out of your eye, but you're managing to see the speck in someone else's eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? And then Jesus gets real personal, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The two-pronged problem in my marriage and the two-pronged problem in your marriage is the presence of sin and the absence of mercy. And so maybe what we need to do is begin with a daily prayer. And and, uh, Megan Marcroft was gracious enough. It was a rough week for her because of the retreat and things. But she made some cards. I mentioned uh, these three daily prayers to you, and some of you asked for copies of that. And she made a card for you. Uh, They're probably out in the lobby someplace. You can pick one up, but you can get those. But I I want to add to those prayers something else. Add this prayer. Daily prayer as you begin. Heavenly Father, help me to see... My sin first. Heavenly Father, help me to see my sin first. I naturally default to looking at the sins of others, especially if they have wronged me, but allow me to see my sin first. But then also, allow me to see my sin as worse. Allow my sin to go under the microscope, to take my wife's away and put my sin there and allow me to see the damage that I do because my sin is worse. So Heavenly Father, help me today to see my sin first, my sin is worse, and my sin the most. Help me to see that. My sin first, my sin worse, And my sin the most. Allow me to see those things. Because what happens so often is we get this scorecard where maybe maybe Debbie has sinned more than I have. And so I've got a little bit more weight there. But rather to see my sin as most. And what can happen so often is it could truly bless us and prepare us for what has to go. So here's the thing. Today, today I know As I pray this prayer, today I know that I am a sinner and I am going to cross paths and cross words with someone. Maybe my wife, maybe some of you, maybe the elders, maybe the staff, maybe someone in traffic, wherever it is, but I am going, that sin is going to come out. But I also know that I'm going, everybody I encounter is also a sinner. And so they will say things, and they will do things that will rub me the wrong way. But if I am praying my sin first, my sin worse, my sin most, then all of a sudden I begin to see things differently. I begin to not react, but rather respond. Respond with the love of Christ. Now, is there, is there any place in Scripture where we can kind of see this played out? I would contend yes, and it's an unlikely place by an unlikely guy. It's the Apostle Paul in, in 2, Corinthians, or, um, yeah, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. And this is what drives us. This is what drives us to be able to live this way. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And so we've got this beautiful measure of the gospel here is that Christ has died for us. He has lived for us and he died for us. And so now we are free. We no longer have to live for ourselves. And so when I'm praying my sin first, my sin worst, my sin most, I am recognizing that I'm no longer seeking self-fulfillment and self-happiness and self-esteem and all the other things that go with those, but rather I recognize what has been done for me because it is the love of Christ that controls me, not my selfish desires, not my lust, not my wishes, not my expectations, but rather the love of Christ and allows me to no longer live for myself, but live for him because it's, it's his love 
that compels me. It's his love for me that fuels me to be able to love others. It's this vertical aspect of the love of Christ that bleeds out in everyday relationships. In my case, with my wife, with you, with my coworkers, with my neighbors. So do we have an example of that? I think we do. Look at, check this out. 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. And though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. It overflowed to me because of what Christ Jesus has done. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the foremost. What the Apostle Paul here is saying is, when it comes to sinners, my sin first, my sin worst, my sin most. In other words, I'm better than you at sinning. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. And then he just gets doxological. He he goes vertical here. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be here this morning and you think your marriage has gone too far down the tubes. You're overwhelmed by the sin, the evil that has occurred within your marriage? And could it be that just recognizing you pull the weeds, those weeds of sin, they have been growing in the garden of your marriage and they have choked out everything that you've tried to plant. So start pulling those weeds by confessing those sins, recognizing, first of all, that your sin is first, your sin is worse, your sin is most. So pull the weeds of sin from your garden. Then third, plant the seeds of mercy. The goal is not just a weed. The goal is never to have really good-looking dirt. The goal is to plant something that you will be able to enjoy a harvest. And so plant seeds of mercy. Right now in your marriage or in your relationships, you have been praying, I hope, My sin first, my sin worst, my sin most. You've confessed those sins. You've received forgiveness because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. Regardless of the sins, he has forgiven you of those sins. And so now in that relationship, rather than just pull weeds, and and I would never pull a bunch of weeds and take them in a basket and show my wife, look at all the weeds I pulled. But rather, I want to plant seeds. I want to be proactive and plant some seeds in that garden as well that will reap a harvest. Well, what are those seeds? Seeds of mercy. Well, what do I mean by mercy? Mercy points to the kind, sympathetic, and forgiving way we treat others so that their distress is relieved and debt canceled. When someone sins against you, they owe you, and you want to make them pay. You want to make him pay with gossip. You want to make him pay with loss. You want to make him pay with a silent treatment. You want to make him pay by separating yourself from them, but you want to make them pay. But because of Christ and what he's done for us, that debt is canceled. And all of a sudden, it's not just canceled. That weed is not just pulled, but all of a sudden, I desire to do things, and maybe I don't desire, but because of obedience, I do. I do things that relieve their distress. I do things for Debbie or for your spouse in ways that are merciful. Are there times when they don't deserve it? Well, yeah. And those are the times when mercy kicks in. 
when mercy kicks in and he does that for us. So let's get vertical here. I'll show what I mean. Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he, does he remove our transgressions from us. We have this vertical aspect of what God has done for us. He has dealt with you with patience and steadfastness. He does not give you what you deserve. Why? Because he is merciful. He is loving. He is gracious. He is patient. That's what mercy is is refusing to give something that the person deserves, but in turn giving them something that they do not deserve, and that is kindness, to relieve their distress, to make their life better, whatever that looks like. And you know what I thought about? I thought about making a list of things for the screen, but then I realized you already know in your marriage, you already know acts of mercy. You know better than anyone what those acts of mercy are for your spouse. So do them. Because God has been merciful to you, you can be merciful to them. In marriage, we are given ample opportunity to give and receive mercy. So we've got this vertical aspect of the mercy of God, but now we look now to the horizontal. Paul says in in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Okay, what? I mean, that's impossible, Paul. I mean, how do we do that? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. If I see, in my case, if I see Debbie's sin as first, I see her sin as worse, I see her sin as most, there is zero humility in me Zero gentleness, zero patience, and there's no way I'm going to bear up with it. Because I'm always hammering, always making her change, always wanting her to change, always keeping her sin fresh in front of her. Even though she has been forgiven vertically by God, if I see her sin as first and her sin is worst and her sin is most, then all I'm doing is making sure she sees that. And there is zero humility in me or gentleness, or patience. But then, a chapter later, Paul says kind of the same thing. Therefore, be imitators of God. Oh, okay, Paul, sure, we'll do that. I'm going to make some changes right now and be like God. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Do you you see what he's done here? Imitate God. Well, how do I do that? Well, how has he treated you? He's treated you with patience, love, mercy, grace. And so now the word of God says, go do that. That's how you imitate God. That's how you imitate the one who loves you and has saved you and has cared for you all of this time. Seeds and weeds are little And then they're not. Weeds grow and they choke out whatever seed you planted. And so pull those weeds and plant the seeds of kindness in their place. And maintain those weeds and every day, every day pray, Heavenly Father, allow me to see my sin first, my sin worse, and my sin most. Here's some questions I'd like you to ask yourself. How strong is the connection between God's mercy and you? It might be that you're here this morning and you don't see a connection. You're not a Christian. You're you're thinking about it, maybe kicking the tires, looking at us, thinking, you know, if I become a Christian, I'm going to hang out with people like this. Do I really want that? There is a direct connection that God is offering you right now. Through his son, Jesus Christ, 
He is, he is giving you a gift of salvation. You all just need, to re, you just need to receive it. Like any gift, you receive it. You receive it trusting that the gift has conditions that Jesus Christ met. You see, God expects perfection from you. Not trying harder, but perfection. And that is impossible. And so what he has done is he has taken the impossible and made it possible through the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ, who hung on a cross for the sins of all who believe. Is that you? If that is you, if you're saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe that he is my Lord, my friend, there is a direct connection between you and God's mercy right now. You have been forgiven. And God is that free He is that giving. He is that loving that he has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. He took your sin and placed them on innocent Christ and then took innocent Christ's righteousness, his perfection, and put it on you. This great exchange. So now when he sees believer in Jesus Christ, and Christian, listen to this, when he sees you, yeah, he sees the sin, But his smile is upon you, not because you've managed to be good today, not because you're here today, but because he sees Jesus. That's who he sees. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Is there that connection for you between God's mercy and you? How much mercy have you been pouring on your marriage and or your most important relationships? Or like me, do you, do you default to accenting, maximizing the sins of others when they've wronged you and minimizing your own? So how much mercy have you been pouring on your marriage and or your most important relationships? Are you responding to others' weakness and sin the way Christ responds to you in your weakness and in your sin? We live in a very vitriolic world right now. We live in a violent world, an angry world. Have you sensed that? Is that people are just angrier. And I think what can happen is that can serve the gospel very, very well because we have not been called to be that. We have been called to be merciful and gracious because we have received mercy from this one that had every right to judge us, condemn us, and throw his wrath at us. Are you responding to others' weaknesses, your spouse's weaknesses, and their sin the way Christ has responded to you? And then finally, is mercy showing up in your marriage and home? Is it being passed along and poured out on others? If not, why not? And what happens here so often is we develop a you-first mentality. I'll do that when you do it. Is that the mercy of God? Did God say, I will save you if you kind if you of make some changes in your life? No. So what happens so often in our marriages, in our very close relationships, is we develop this you first mentality. I will do what I'm supposed to do by God's grace, but you go first. What would happen in your marriage today, right now, if you just simply develop this I will go first, and I will go second, and I will go third, I will go fourth, because of what's been done for me. Let's stand together. The elders will be up here uh, this morning at the end of the service. If you want prayer, just say, hey, this is a season at the bottom, and we need your help. We would love to pray for you and care for you. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for, for passages like Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not chide, and not hold our sin against us. As far as the east is from the west, he casts it from us. We praise you, Lord God, for that grace, for that awareness. Make us that with each other. Transform our hearts so that we see our own sin first, our own sin worse, our own sin most. 
and realize what you have done for us, and now you call us to do it for others. Make that happen in our marriages. Make that happen in our relationships. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, and we all say together, forever and ever, amen. Have a great day. I love you. Hey, the guys, thank you so much for joining us. One takeaway I had, just as Craig was landing the plane there, uh, it reminds me of something G.K. Chesterton said, actually. Uh, he was writing into a newspaper editor, the anecdote goes, uh, because the newspaper had posed the question, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton's response was all of like five words. It was, good sirs, I am, four words, right? I am what's wrong with the world. And the fundamental narrative shift Craig seems to be laying down here from the scriptures is that in our marriages, if we were to be asked, what is wrong with your marriage? Each of us would say, oh, that's easy. I am, I am what's wrong with my marriage. And that's the kind of vulnerability and transparency that only the gospel enables us to have, where we can assume until demonstrated otherwise that a lot of what's going on with our marriage, uh, it's in my backyard, it's in my purview, it's in my actions, it's in my unforgiveness, my bitterness, my unrealistic expectations. The gospel frees us to start bringing our life under Jesus' like lordship because we can start with the glaring errors that we ourselves are bringing to the equation without fear of condemnation, right? So it kind of makes you wonder what happens, what changes in marriage when both parties assume from the get-go, I'm what's wrong with the marriage. It kind of reminds you of what Jesus said about the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. And I, there could be a case to be made that, yeah, theirs is the transformed marriage too. Those, those who are poor in spirit, those who are willing to assume that their own sin at the table is enough to bear the conver to merit the conversations that are hard. Um, and when both spouses do that, yeah, that's a recipe for fertile soil. That's a recipe for growth. It's a recipe for, I think, an echo of the marriage we thought we would have one day, right? So, all right, that's all we got today. Uh, if you are new here, uh, click on the link in the description to get in touch with us. We'd love to get in touch with you. Uh, until next time, my name's Cole Harper, uh, signing off. Have a great day.